James Melville. James, uh, welcome to the show. It's always Evening, George. a pleasure uh, to see you. Let me uh, start by asking for your reflections on the man in that removal van uh, currently backing out of Downing Street. Um, good riddance to bad rubbish. I mean, I've said this for a long time that he's the ultimate charlatan. The only thing he's fit for purpose for is winning elections, which says more about the country itself than maybe him. Um, but he was there by design to get Brexit done in whatever shape or form. Um, there's no doubting his election successes, but there's a lot of doubt over his integrity. Um, and I think sometimes someone's greatest strength and greatest weakness can be both their strength and failing within politics as well. And I think that's his ability to, to charm, but to the point of deception. And I think that's what his undoing would have been in the end. And it's even happening this week, where in his last demob happy week, he's talking about buying a new kettle at an expense of twenty pounds that can suddenly solve an energy crisis. Um, so yes, he's the, he'll go down in history as someone who had an ability to charm and cajole and win elections. But in terms of his legacy, it's uh, it's basically tumbleweed. There hasn't been much achieved. And he's leaving the country in a much worse state than when he arrived, in particular one of the worst cost of living crises, not just in this generation, but many generations. And that's largely because of the important things, serving the people and looking after the people, he's been asleep at the wheel. And the Tory party generally have been asleep at the wheel for weeks, conducting a leadership contest that's like the worst elements of The Apprentice. And meanwhile, Britain are watching their energy fees go up, not just in households, but also businesses as well. And the businesses don't have the cap. And now we're going into the autumn and still nothing has been achieved. Johnson's given the impression, even though he was ousted, he gave off the impression he was demob happy, putting his trotters up on various beaches around the Mediterranean, rather than at least trying to do the job that he was still paid for, and that's be prime minister. So I think to summarise all of that and that slight rant about Boris Johnson, I'm no fan. Um, I think it's good that he's gone, but I think the alternatives aren't really going to give us much relief. What we need is actually politicians who are doing what we pay them to do, and that is serve our people to make sure that they've got legacy investment in public services and infrastructures, and to make sure that we do not create perfect storms when there's a crisis. The energy crisis is a perfect example of that, whereby for generations, governments have failed to put an energy strategy in place, have not used all of our natural assets in this, this island to good effect, a reliance on foreign, policy, foreign, foreign energy, and also combined with basically a short-term economic strategy to try and provide solutions for not just households, but also businesses as well. So we've got a perfect storm of circumstances. And as part of Johnson's legacy, he's been asleep at the wheel over what is a mounting um, energy crisis over the next few months. Well, there may be a PS, uh, James, uh, written on lavender notepaper. Uh, I was around as you were not for Harold Wilson's resignation honours. Wait till you see Boris Johnson's resignation honours is all I'll say to you on that. Uh, you made the point that the alternatives are grim, and that's certainly true in the uh, grimace of uh, Sir Keir Starmer, but what about the mini, uh, I call her midget Maggie, uh, Liz Truss, who will be along in a minute. Are you expecting anything from her? I mean, the only reason she's going to win this is because Sunak's conducted one of the worst leadership campaigns on record. He's literally gone against his base. I think basically saying there should be more um, taxation and not doing anything about national insurance that he himself raised and effectively creating more cost of living problems on a cost of living crisis is the reason he's not going to win. It's been a terrible campaign. So Liz Truss, I think, has got lucky. She's seen, the sort of lesser, she's seen as the lesser of all evils. But based on our presentation style, her track record in government, her ability to get under the skin of a brief and come up with solutions that are legacy solutions, not just rhetoric and sound bites, I have no faith. But, you know, I don't want to be judgmental before she started, but maybe ye of little faith. Well, uh, she'll, she's, she was not Rishi Sunak, which was her best asset. Uh, maybe in parenthesis, she had a white face, uh, which up against uh, a black man in, uh, in a conservative party, uh, largely still 
populated, 150,000 of them, by uh, golf club boars, gin and jag bigots, uh, helped her too. And she'll be helped by the fact she's not Keir Starmer. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, look, I mean, this is it's a terrible lesson of all evils. We're at a situation, maybe I'm just sounding old here, George, but I think it seems to be law diminishing returns with our politicians. I mean, looking back in the day, going back to the 80s, 90s, whether you agreed with what was then the left versus right ideological divide, I don't think it is that anymore. It's something very different. It's, it's, it's more about authoritarianism versus a form of liberalism and libertarianism. But that's a separate debate. I think the cycle of politicians is diminishing. We seem to have machine politicians now who are in it for, to feather their own nests, but they don't have an ideological vision. Energy policy is a perfect example of that because, you know, if you compare the UK even to the French, the French have got the biggest kind of nuclear supplies. The UK have got under 15%. We, we don't, we've, we don't for, for instance, have a conversation about other forms of energy, how it's all in the mix. We're reliant on overseas um, supply. And we're leaving ourselves wide open to the current crisis where basically um, corporate spivs are charging through the roof. We're going to put businesses and households under the line. This is all, but, but fundamentally, the reason for all of that is because of our politicians who are failing us, because they're not getting on top with, of, of the brief with long-term solutions. This, this has been going on for far too long. We seem to have almost like a carnival of the grotesque, like some sort of game show, or some sort of talent show of mediocrity within our top-tier politics. Um, if we think that Liz Truss, Liz Truss is a solution, then we we haven't got a solution, we've got a big problem. Yeah, uh, Britain's not got talent. There would be a game <laughs> show uh, on which they would all excel. Um, I know, by the way, uh, because if you, if you heard my monologue, I have been banging on about energy for 50 years of my life. And nobody even wanted to talk about energy. It was Boersville. Uh, the, the chamber would empty uh, when any uh, discussion on energy policy uh, came up. The coal mining industry was destroyed, not for uh, energy reasons or economic reasons, but for political reasons. Uh, what's going to happen now, James? You're a man with your finger on the pulse. Uh, I was one of the people that refused to pay my poll tax and thereby contributed in the end to the downfall of Margaret Thatcher. We must be headed into that territory now. The difference being, at a push, people could have paid their poll tax. It doesn't matter how hard they push, they won't be able to pay their gas and electricity bill. I think that's right. It's very different. If you look at some of the examples already starting with this various owners of pubs saying they're going from bills of 50,000 to 450,000. That's not, you can't, that's just a jump too far. It's, it's, it's an appalling jump. So you've got the two crises hand in hand. You've got households, we're suddenly looking at a jump from say 150 to 500 pounds, we're looking at business where it's multitudes of thousands. Now, I mean, I'm, I, I mean, I agree with you in terms of what's happened in terms of legacy with, um, with mining. It's not the knock on effects we've talked about quite often. It's not just about, creating a schism with our energy supply, but it's also been the hollowing out of communities, areas that you and I both grew, grew up in, the hollowing out of communities for 40 years since Britain became deindustrialized. Now, I recognize we've got to move with the times and get industries that are relevant to the times, but right now, the here and now times, we've got an, a double whammy of an energy supply crisis and an energy pricing crisis. And that's only, and those two things are combined what binds them together is that we don't have an effective energy strategy. And considering the assets around Britain, I find that utterly ludicrous and appalling. And it's excessive governments that have done that because they've been asleep at the wheel. And, if, and combined with the fact that because we don't have an energy strategy and we basically hollowed out our industries back in the 80s, we've got communities from Cornwall right up to Scotland which haven't regenerated. They've had 40 years of decline. That's part of the problem as well. And governments haven't got on top of that issue either. So in terms of our very found, and don't even start before we go on about education and the NHS, there's a multitude of problems there as well. Our very foundations of public services and infrastructures and industry have not been taken care of 
for, for 40 years at least. And the chickens are coming home to roost right now with this monumental energy crisis, pricing crisis, that is going to be way, way beyond anything that we've seen in terms of tragic human interest stories on the doorstep and in businesses. People will be un unable to pay, plus businesses will go under with the massively inflated costs. And meanwhile, we have a government that hasn't done anything through the leadership contest apart from just tokenism. Our parliament's been shut on recess in a national looming emergency. And we, meanwhile, what's coming down the tracks is increased prices as we go on towards the winter. And it seems to be the only strategy at the moment is cross our fingers and hope that it doesn't get too cold. That's not good enough. We pay our taxes. We expect better solutions from our leaders. And we haven't been getting effective solutions for a very long time. And now we're facing another crisis because of governments, not just this government, previous governments have taken the eye off the ball. One of the essential aspects of the very pillars and foundations of a stable society, and that's energy supply and energy pricing. Well, the latest inflation prediction is 22%. Uh, it was it was 16% prediction the week before. Uh, now it's 22%. It might be 25. It might be 30. It might be runaway inflation. Uh, and of course, all these businesses that cannot pay their energy bills are going to throw more and more people onto the unemployment heap. May, and those people will then be as incapable as anyone of paying uh, gas and electricity prices at this uh, level. We've really got the makings of a crisis uh, here, James. And you and I are in agreement that the current crop of political leaders uh, are not up to the uh, up to the challenge. You know, we don't have solutions. That's the thing. You know, it's but it's also it does remind me a little bit of the poll tax. You touched on that earlier. I remember that. I know people power managed to basically nudge the government and was a Trojan horse to the the fall of Thatcher. But this is what we need for this. Is it's going to be something whereby it does get coordinated there has to be protesting there has to be aspects i think of non-compliance but that's only going to happen because it's a zero-sum game for people there's no choice people will just simply not be able to pay the level of bills that we're talking about here whether it's household or business and then the knock-on effects of that are more poverty more homelessness job losses supply chain effects because other businesses are affected because the source of business they're working on goes under as well we're heading for a perfect storm now we were warning about this energy crisis Months ago, inflation was going up. There was problems coming down the tracks from all different sources, whether it's to do with the war, whether it's to do with lockdowns, whether it's to do with the fact that basically Britain are sort of exposed in terms of not in complete control of their energy supply. These problems were already there. And inflation was creeping up, but the government didn't do anything about it. And it reminds me of it's the same thing as the NHS when the government are constantly saying through the pandemic, we've got to protect the NHS. But meanwhile, bed numbers are going down investment in real terms going down as well and the staff shortages the government have had two cycles now of winters in the in the nhs to sort out but they haven't but it goes back even further than that every winter the stories about the nhs is in crisis again now we're getting the same stories about energy supply the very foundations of what we expect as citizens in this country they're not being fulfilled so that you know it poses the question what exactly are we paying our taxes for if our government isn't investing our money wisely, or we're not getting the caliber of politicians to come up with long-term strategy, where is the social contract right now if we're going to go into the winter with a potential NHS crisis, potentially a food shortage crisis, combined with an energy crisis? It's simply not good enough. James Mavol, you're a wise man. Thanks for sharing your wisdom uh, with us.